Brand Helwig, faculty director of the graduate tax program uh, here at NYU. And it's my privilege this evening to welcome all of you who are with us in person, all of you who are attending remotely on our Zoom webinar. Uh, it's my privilege to welcome you this evening to our second installment of the Jerome Manning um, Tax Salon series that we have uh, here at NYU. And before we begin our program, I want to take just a few minutes to um, acknowledge Jerry Manning, for whom um, this event is named, who has generously endowed our annual speaker series. Um, Jerry's a graduate of the NYU Law School class of 1952. He joined the law firm of Strook, Strook and Levan in 1961, where he went on to have a phenomenal career in the estate and gift taxation field, specializing in estate planning. Um, he authored the definitive treatise on estate planning. It's aptly named Manning on Estate Planning and um, it's published by the Practicing Law Institute and it is now in its seventh edition. Um, Jerry Manning um, has made just remarkable contributions to the NYU School of Law over the years, um, being a generous financial supporter uh, uh, for decades, endowing this particular salon event. Um, but maybe perhaps most significantly in my mind, he contributed to uh, our graduate tax program by serving as an adjunct professor for 40 years. Uh, and 25 of those years, he taught the estate planning capstone course um, I think we'll hear about this in a little bit, but interestingly, Judge Vasquez, our, our honored guest this evening, uh, took one of Jerry's estate plan, took that, that capstone estate planning course from Jerry. And yes. Um, so I personally would like to, to take this occasion to thank Jerry for everything that he has done for our law school, for our graduate tax program, and for generously endowing this event, which gives us an occasion to get together this evening. Um, and to have dialogue about current tax issues and to uh, meet distinguished professionals in their arena. And this evening, we'll get a chance to learn more about Judge Vasquez and, um, and his career, uh, well, in tax, before the tax court, and then his time on the, on the bench. Um, so if you would, please join me in just a round of applause to thank, acknowledge Jerry Mann to thank him for this event. And now I'd like to introduce our distinguished guest, Judge Juan F. Vasquez, um, who currently serves as a senior judge of the United States Tax Court. Um, let me give you just a, a, a bit of brief background before we begin, but um, Judge Vasquez is a graduate of the University of Texas. Um, he received his bachelor's in business administration with a focus in accounting in 1972. He spent some time in the accounting industry before deciding to go to law school. Uh, began his law school career at SUNY Buffalo, and then not long after that, returned to his home state of Texas, where he concluded his um, law school studies, received his JD degree from the University of Houston School of Law. Following law school, um, Judge Vasquez came immediately here to the uh, graduate tax program at NYU, was a student here from 1977 to 1978. After that, um, uh, by the way, I and say that he, Judge Vasquez, came to, to NYU, came along with his wife, Terry, and um, if I'm correct, your newborn son at the time, who was with us as well. But I'd like to acknowledge um, Terry Vasquez and Juan Jr., who are with us this evening. They were part of that initial trip to um, NYU for the, the LLM year. Um, by the way, Juan Jr. Uh, is also a graduate of the tax program, 2002 graduate. And their um, second son, Jaime, is also a graduate of the tax program. This one I'm not as familiar with. 2008, does that sound? 2008, 2009. Okay, so 2009 graduate. So we've got a lot of connections of the Vasquez family to our tax program here at NYU. That's right. Okay. All right. It's wonderful to have Claire Amelia with us here as well. Um, so, we, so Judge Vasquez is a product of the NYU tax program. Um, after graduating, he and his family returned to Texas. Um, he began, Judge Vasquez began practice with the IRS chief counsel's office, litigating tax cases on behalf of the government for a number of years uh, before he um, decided to pursue his tax career in, in private practice. Did so returning to San Antonio, the area in which uh, Judge Vasquez grew up. Uh, with a firm and then eventually went out on his own to have a solo tax practice 
And then in 1994, he was nominated by President Clinton to the tax court bench um, confirmation and appointment in 1995. At that point, uh, Judge Vasquez was the first individual of Hispanic descent to be appointed to the tax court, served a 15 year term, was then reappointed by President Obama in 2011, if I have that right. Um, 2010. 2010, close. Uh, and for another 15 year term that was going to extend through 2026. But, uh, but now Judge Vasquez has assumed senior status on the, on the tax court. Uh, by the way, there is a phenomenal biography of Judge Vasquez that was authored by, in part, by his wife, Terry, along with Anthony Head, um, published what, maybe two or three years ago by the ABA two years ago. Um, and here's a, a picture of Judge Vasquez as a little boy in uh, the fields of South Texas, um, picking cotton with his grandfather, um, Jesus Flores. Yes, And uh, this is, this picture was um, the Vasquez family commissioned Jesse Trevino, a famous Mexican-American artist to um, to take this photo, uh, ink this picture, which hangs in, I should know this, is it a copy that hangs in your chamber? The, is that the, the original. Is that the original? The, and so, uh, and so that, this it. is a picture of that painting. Los Piscadores. Los Piscadores. Los Piscadores, that means the, the cotton yeah. pickers. So anyway, this is a phenomenal biography of a, what really is a remarkable life that Judge Vasquez has led. I think this evening we'll, we'll kind of focus more on uh, NYU years, time in practice, um, time on the tax court bench, but it is, um, you know, it's really something of a un truly unbelievable life story that is captured in this fantastic biography. So if you would, please join me in welcoming Judge Vasquez back to NYU. Thank, thank you. And, and Brent, thank you. Thank you for writing the forward, the beautiful forward and in, in the painting and the book from the Texas Cotton Fields to the United States Tax Court. Life Journey of Juan Vasquez. I know that's a long title. <laughs> but a good one. But a good one. Yeah, and I did have the privilege of writing the foreword in, in the book. And um, that was, it was fun to, to kind of reflect back on both my experience with you and then just some reflections from having read um, uh, the biography that was drafted by Terry. It's really, it really is phenomenal. Okay, so I, I want to keep this to be a, a fairly uh, informal event. I've got a number of questions that I thought I would um, pose to Judge Vasquez so we could have a conversation. If any of you all have questions along the way, please feel free to um, you know, raise your hand, let us know, and we'll also be sure to reserve time at the end of our discussion for questions from the audience. Okay. Thank you. Um, so just a, just a few questions that I got down. Maybe the first one is, why don't you just describe um, Judge, your path from law school to uh, the NYU program, kind of what interested you in tax along the way? Of course, you had an accounting background before you went to law school. Right. But how'd you get, tell us about your time in law school and how that um, uh, ended up leading you to, to come to NYU. Well, my first year of law school was at SUNY in Buffalo. And, and uh, I, I, Terry and I, when we made, tr try to make the decision whether we should go to Buffalo, New York, we, we never looked at the map and figure out figured out where Buffalo was at. We thought it was on the East Coast. Uh, so it turned they out to be- They probably didn't have Weather Channel back It was then. more than, uh, the internet, not, I don't think had been invented yet. <laughs> but our, one thing that we learned in, during the Christmas holidays when we were in Buffalo, New York, and we went back to San Antonio was that um, a friend of mine asked me where, you, where I planned to practice. I said, well, in Texas. He said, well, in Buffalo, you, you don't learn oil and gas law and you don't have to take marital property rights. So that's on the Texas bar. So Terry and I decided to move back to Texas. I went to University of Houston Law Center and we were glad that we got accepted. And while we were there, I came upon my, got, had the good fortune of coming into contact with my professor and mentor ta in tax, mm -hmm. Professor Ira Shepard. And uh, when he, as soon as he got there, I, co I took corporate tax from him at night. Uh, because there wasn't enough students during the daytime, I wanted to take corporate tax. So there it was, it was about 11 or 12 students at night from the, firm, the big firms that were willing to take them. And so I became his research assistant at Southern Federal Taxes. He was a special counsel to them. Um, and we, we really trusted Professor Shepard. 
And when I was research, his research as an exhibit, after I finished it, one, I think you should go to NYU to get their graduate tax program. And it was a kind of advice, but it was more like a com friendly command. Mm -hmm. We should consider it. Okay. And I, it, was, it was very good advice. I, I, I got together with Terry and I, we both trusted and believed in Professor Shepard. We decided to follow his advice. And, but, but by that time we had Juan Jr. in our 30 year law school at the University of Houston. And so it was gonna be, you know, it, it's, it's difficult enough coming to New York City and living as a student here, but to come with a child, it, it's pretty challenging. <laughs> but thanks to you know, NYU, they had student, ho student housing at uh, um, Hayden Hall. Judge, I think what's the point this way, which is um, now Lipton Hall, used to be Hayden Hall for, the, for a long time, until just a few years ago. But... Right, and I, I looked at my NYU transcript Today, today, and sure enough, it, it showed me at the 33 Washington Square Park, right. unit number 16L. <laughs> that was good, good part. Uh, so uh, anyway, it was a wonderful place to be at. So the, Professor Shepard is the one that steered us here. And, and that year that he steered us here to from U of H, University of Houston Law School. He sent four students, Max Zimmerman from Houston, Paul Dostard from Iowa, who ended up in, in, in San Diego, and, and Jay Renstra. So there was four of us from NYU. Four you uh, from, 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 from U of H okay. that came from NYU. Wow. So that was pretty, it was pretty impressive Absolutely. for him to send four students. So that, that's, that's how we ended up. And then we ended up in NYU. Terry and I had never been to New York City. So everything was new for us. It was exciting. And uh, I remember Terry taking one junior on the stroller around Washington Square Park. <laughs> sure. So, all right, so um, tell us a little bit about some of your memories from your time studying in the graduate tax program at NYU. Okay. What, what, what are some of, um, you know, some of the experiences that stick with you today? Well, uh, you know, the, our NYU year, everything was memorable. Everything was memorable, including living here for the first time in New York, being here with, a, with a, our, almost 12 month old son. But as far as the school, what I remember, I was so impressed with the quality of the, how, how smart the students were. Um, very, it was very, it, the, the students were so smart and hardworking. They, they only made me work harder too. But, but I thought I was a text hotshot already. I, I thought, but I'm, I'm glad I kept it to myself. <laughs> Because I, I had become a CPA in California first. Well, I was live was when I was with Library Ross Brothers in Montgomery, which a year later became Coopers and Library, and then P uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers, now PwC. And so I, I had prepared tax returns during the tax season at Coopers and Library. Mm -hmm. So I, I really thought I knew tax. Little did I know until I got here that how little how little I actually I, I knew in tax law. Well, I think a lot of our students sometimes feel the same way. So that's, that's good to hear. But um, anyway, so it, it was a terrific year. Students were very smart. Uh, we, we had a lot of good students. Um, I remember Tom Larson from Nebraska, Rudy Bramali from, from, uh, from New Orleans, uh, Tom Wells classmates. from Georgia. He was, he was my classmate. He lived in, I think, 15K. Uh, he became a judge before I did, seven or eight years. And Tom Wells, my classmate from NYU, swore me in, in my investiture on Cinco de Mayo, 1995. Okay. So that's pretty neat. neat. So two members of your class end up um, being appointed to the tax court bench. It's got to be pretty neat to be sworn in, having been sworn in from your classmates. Right. And Evelyn Paycheck from, from my class here, she ended up being commissioner of internal revenue, um, exempt organizations. Okay. So we, we, we had a a nice class. Sure. And what were some of your favorite classes during your time here? You know, in looking at my transcript, I, I really enjoyed estate planning when I took him from, well, I, I, I would call him Professor Manning. And I was so impressed with him because he was an adjunct professor. And we didn't have many adjunct professors. When I was at SUNY at Buffalo, not that I, I wasn't even aware that we had any adjunct professors at University of Houston. 
Uh, I wasn't aware of any adjunct professors, but when I met Professor Jer uh, Jer uh, Jer Jer Professor Manning, mm -hmm. I took his class. I was so impressed with him because he, he made estate planning fun. And, and, but I was so impressed the way he dressed. He was so well dressed. I thought that that's the way successful tax lawyers should look like. <laughs> <laughs> but the other the other class that I really enjoyed was criminal penalties and civil penalties with mm -hmm. with Professor Michael Mike Salzman. Right. And of course, uh, I really enjoyed taking um, the founder of the program, Jerry Wallace, Carol Wallace. I took two courses from him, one each semester, and and Charlie Lyons. Right. I, I think those are the two founders of the sure, program. These, those are some of the titans of the graduate tax program. And then it took, it started in 1945. And, and then uh, 1945 is when it started? That's right. Uh, Dale Har Har Harvey Dale. Harvey Dale, yes. Uh, I, I took international from I, I forgot whether I took inbound or outbound, but I took the one, the first one. Okay. Inbound, I think. Right. That's right. <laughs> and Professor Rollison was fun. He taught uh, tax accounting. And then uh, George Zeidlin. Mm -hmm. Took him and I, I made an A in his class. So I remember him. Sure. <laughs> think, yeah, we all remember those those classes. And then we had the, the young the young people, like Brooks Billman and Noah Cunningham. They were very energetic. So the professors were fun. And that's funny that you meant that Judge Vasquez refers to those professors as the young folks. Those are the kind of the titans of the program that uh, existed when I came through, over twenty years after you did. Um, but yeah, it's nice to have that. It's interesting to think of them who are, uh, Noel Cunningham is in his final year on the faculty, will be retiring at the end, end of this year. It's interesting to think of uh, Professor right. Cunningham just starting off in, in his academic career. Right, and I don't know if Professor Bo Brooks Billman and Professor Noel Cunningham, whether they were the, under the same program that you were under, where they were like... T I think that's probably the case. The, the, yeah. the, the, they were impressive professors. Absolutely. So, um, okay, so after NYU, you began um, uh, your tax practice with the IRS Chief Counsel's yes. Office. Tell us just more about that experience, the transition to private practice, what kind of work you were doing in private practice. Right. Well, I, when I was here in 77, 78, I, I, I applied with all the law firms in Houston, Dallas, and the big ones. I wanted to earn those big bucks, but I didn't get any offers from there, but I got offers from the honors programs at Chief Counsel IRS in, in Houston. And for, I got a, an offer from the Department of Justice Tax Division um, in, in Washington, DC. But Terry and I wanted to return to Texas. So where our, our son, one junior could grow up with his, my, my grandparents mm -hmm. and, her, and her parents. And so we ended up taking the, the offer from Office of Chief Counsel IRS and we ended up in Houston, uh, which was great because at that time, Chief Counsel had the, uh, the, the rule that you couldn't work in your home state, but they were, they were eliminating okay. it. And so we, were, we, we left the NYU program. As soon as we graduated, went down to Washington, DC. They told me the good news is you got Houston, the bad news, here, here it is in June 1st or right after the program finished. He said, but you don't start until August the 6th. Oh, I thought you were going to say the bad news is you got Houston. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we had to take a long extended vacation with, with okay. a, a toddler. And, and we went to Tacoma, Washington to visit my sister for two weeks. All right. And then to Los Angeles where we bought a, a, a used van from my uncle. And a few weeks there, I went to see Ter Terry's sister, Sylvia, in San Diego. So it, it was a much needed vacation. Sure. But uh, anyway, it was, and I think it was a lot fun. of our students, current students, look forward to that. They're getting some traveling in after right. they finish up their program before they start their job. But, but working at Chief Counsel was very interesting. It gave me an opportunity to grow, to really grow professionally. It gave me a lot of confidence. So, to any of you that are considering either working for the Department of Justice or the tax or Chief Counsel IRS, it's a wonderful employer. You get a lot of experience. You go because of my NYU experience. And my, and my NYU LLM program, during the first or second week, I was thrown into some very serious litigation, but they felt I could handle it because of my NYU background. Uh, NYU really prepared me to, 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 um, to take on whatever came at me. 
So a judge on my right in this, if you, so you started the chief counsel's office in the fall of 78, is that? I tried, I tried August 6th. That's August 6th, not, a little not, early, earlier than fall. Not, is that the era when we had um, uh, kind of a, a rampant tax shelters that were being employed, lots of litigation in the tax shelter arena? This is, of course, before we had Section 465 come into the books, before we had 469, the passive activity loss rules. I think of that as the era of, of tax. I'm, I don't know how much of that um, you were involved with when you were chief counsel's office in you know, I, I started in August 6, 1978 with chief counsel, and we, we had a, a number of TEFRA cases, but I, I think but by that time, the court had been increased from 16 judges to 19 judges. As I recall, it re increased from, to 19 judges because of the TEFRA years, mm -hmm. and, but we were very busy at that time, and, but I, I don't know if there was the peak of the TEFRA years. But we definitely were busy. And I know that I was very proud of the fact that I handled over 200 cases, get, get ready for trial. And I, I had 10 opinions. Three of them were division opinions. And the division opinions is where you as a lawyer or the, you are trying the case and the judge make case law because the judge interprets and issues an opinion that's, quote, considered a division opinion or you're interpreting the statute for the first time. So I had three division opinions, four or five memorandum opinions, and two summary opinions. So I had a really good experience of working at chief counsel. And just as a reminder for the students, division opinions at the tax court, those are opinions that kind of represent the, um, they're issued by one judge, but they are they have precedential effect on the entire tax court. A TC memo case is, at least the theory is, that's a narrow settled issue of tax law that you're going to apply to a distinct set of facts. Right. But, um, there's the prospect of division opinions being reviewed by the entire tax court bench, but they have binding effects. So it's even when you're working at the tax court, when you're clerking, it's fun to get your, to be able to participate in a, the, the drafting and the issuance of a division opinion. Yeah. A little nerve wracking at times when you get comments from other judges that come in that, um, right. unless they're really favorable. Then Court conference is a very interesting procedure under code section 7460, where the chief judge sends a case to the conference of the entire court. O only the chief judge has that authority. But usually when you're getting ready to interpret a statute for the first time, or you're reversing a, a prior tax court opinion, or you're invalidating a, a regulation, I get sent to court conference, but it, it's pretty nerve wracking. You, you, you were with me when we handled the Rochelle case mm -hmm. uh, that you, you worked on, and, and uh, we're in, interpreting what the last, what the effect of and those are deficiency where Congress had said it shall, IRS shall state the last day, and we went to court conference and uh, I, I had a vote of ten, and I had but I had like three or four dissenting opinions, very. The Judge Vasquez just doesn't know, in court conference, they'll say, Judge Vasquez just doesn't know how to read the statute. <laughs> right. So, or, you know, or other judges, whoever, whoever happens to be under the microscope. So court conference is a very unique procedure. And, yeah. and just to follow up on that, so the tax court is one of the few um, trial level courts where you could have an opinion that's issued where there's um, a majority opinion and judges will sign on to that. There might be concurring opinions, uh, dissenting opinions. This is all at the trial level. That sounds very appellate uh, when you describe it that way, appellate in nature. And one of the things that I still have a hard time imagining from the standpoint of a litigator, you could try your case before a particular judge. That case goes to court conference. Um, maybe the, the proposed opinion from the judge that tried the case ends up not carrying the day. Um, and so your, the opinion in your case could be authored by a judge that you've never heard of before, right? That, a judge that you didn't try the case before. Um, and then maybe the judge before whom you tried the case could end up authoring a dissent. That happens from time to time. Right. It has to be pretty staggering from the standpoint um, but both the, the counsel who litigate the case and the, and the party as well. Yeah, actually the Fifth Circuit in a case called McCord, M-C-C-O-R-D, described our procedure as somewhat of a, like an in-bank proceeding, which is right. 
but it's not in bunk because the parties don't know we're meeting. That's right. So, so you, you the trier that tried the case, instead of writing the majority opinion, you can write, you potentially could write the dissenting opinion. But in, but in that case that you worked on, Brent, you might remember, I was affirmed by the Fifth Circuit and the Fifth Circuit said, we, we very one statement, the, we, we affirm for the reasons set forth in Judge Vasquez's excellent opinion, which he, he, he nine concurring opinions, it's, that's in a, right. that's, anyway. that's a nice, that's a nice way to be affirmed. Aren't right, you? you did a good job, right? <laughs> The clerk. That that case was interesting, as Judge Vasquez mentioned. Um, this is part of maybe the tax. Uh, I can't remember the name of the legislation, but the, the IRS Restructuring Act of 1998, where they were part of that overarching part of that litigate of that legislation was we wanted the IRS to be more taxpayer friendly, and one directive that they had was for the IRS to put on a notice of deficiency which we know you've got 90 days from the issuance of the notice of deficiency to file your petition before the tax board if you want to litigate on a deficiency basis. Um, that's subject matter jurisdiction. You miss that 90 days, then your ability to litigate before the tax court is gone. It's eliminated. So to help taxpayers out with that, the idea is we want the IRS to put that date on the notice of deficiency. And they had it on the notice of deficiency, but this one was blank. They just didn't put the date in. And the taxpayer then claimed that, well, if there's no date. Because he, he filed it on the 143 days. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't filed on the 91st day. It was, but the idea was, well, if you don't put the date on there and there's a statutory directive that says you have to, then, um, then I have forever to file the tax. There's no end date. And um, yeah, we got into issues like, well, maybe it's a different issue if you miss it by a day or two, because that's exactly what the statute was intended to avoid. But um, and, and that we, we had three dissenting opinions. Judge Shabbat wrote, Judge Vasquez just doesn't know what the word child means. <laughs> right. So you, I guess you never forget those dissenting opinions when you're in. And, and Judge Foley and wrote an opinion says that means they have an unlimited statute. We, we held that they still had 90 days because of the, 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 the northern division says 90 days. The problem is when you're dealing with subject matter jurisdiction, it's hard. The idea is you can't equitably waive subject matter. That was that was a really fun procedural case to work on, especially when you saw the the different opinions that were being um, circulated among the among the right. But but it it is nerve wracking to go before your fellow students or your fellow uh, judges, and because I, I the tax court travels to seventy four cities around the country. And I always get the opportunity to meet, meet the U.S. District Court judges. And I explain to them about this procedure we have under code section 7460, uh, court conference cases. And they, and they I've, served, I've had several district court judges. So you mean my next door neighbor can get my cash case reversed by the, my fellow judges in this court? No way. Right. <laughs> so they're, they're a, very un, some, a very unusual procedure. Sure. But I think what it, it does help, it, it helps for Congress's goal that the court interpret the Internal Review Code in a, in a uniform consistency throughout our 50 states. And it certainly goes a long way in developing a uniform body of tax court precedent, right? If the other tax court judges have the ability to weigh in on cases that they're going to be bound by in the future in that court conference mechanism, there's some reasons that the chief judge will automatically send the case to the court conference, but there's some discretionary reasons as well. Um, and just, just one more uh, note on the whole court conference procedure. At the, at the tax court in DC, there is the court conference room, right? This room that's off the near the, the chief judge's office. Yes. And it is like, uh, there's this huge oval table, table right? And when Pretty. they're discussing the case in court conference there, they actually, all the presidentially appointed um, judges are there discussing the case. No one else can be in the room at that time, right? No clerks or anything. No, none of the that. clerks can be there. Special trial judges are not there, but the... It has a very Camelot feel to it, right? Where everybody like saddles up in their spot around this big court conference um, table. And, and then tell us about who has to vote first. I think this is interesting. Right. Um, this, I've never seen a table this big, a normal one, but it's, it's enough especially made for the tax court, it must have been. It sits 19 judges. And at, at, at the end of the table, at the beginning is the chief judge. 
And at the other end, way at the other end is the youngest judge on the court. And when I was the youngest judge on the court in 95, Judge Hamlin, Lap Hamlin was the chief judge. And the seniority is this, the youngest judges get to vote first. So I, as the youngest judge, got to vote first. And what you don't want to do, you, I felt the pressure. I don't want to be, I don't want to be the first one to vote and have the other 18 judges vote a different direction. Was there an and, option to pass? No option to pass. Anyway, I know in one of the conferences, one of the chief judges, Judge Hamlin says, Judge Vasquez, you voted against me. Oh, no, 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 Judge, I voted first. You voted against me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we had fun. So just a little bit before we think, talk more about your experience on the tax board, going back to your experience in private practice. Yes. Um, what's something from your time as a solo, well, what, first with a firm, then in solo practice, representing individuals and companies that had tax disputes. What's something you learned in your practice that would be helpful for our students who are with us this evening? Well, I, I was in private practice after chief counsel for four years. I was in private practice from 1982 to 1995 until that point of the court. I was on the court for, I was in private practice for 13 years. And for the first five years, I was a graduate of the LLM program, Leonard Layden, graduated in 1965 uh, with, with him. He, we, the name of the firm was Layden Hood and Vasquez, was three partners. And we, we didn't have any associates, but we had law clerks. We had two or three law clerks in St. Mary's Law School. Okay. And, but, and then after five years, when we grew up to seven lawyers, Leonard said, we're too big, we need to split up. Uh, you, you take two of the lawyers and your secretary and rent from me upstairs, uh, which I did. And so I was in that for eight years, but the last two years I was a solo. But one of the things I learned um, that is helpful, I think, uh, to our students is you can become a successful tax lawyer, even though you don't end up with the big law firms making those big bucks. Although we're, uh, I wanted to get there too, but you know, I wanted to make those big bucks. But but at the same time, I, I chief counsel was definitely for me the right fit. Gave me a lot of confidence trying cases, and but it, the the knowledge I picked up at chief counsel allowed me to represent taxpayers in 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 IRS exam cases, IRS collection cases, criminal tax, and uh, at a, and at a, a administrative appeals at appeals and at a tax court. One of the things I learned is, you know, to whatever opportunity, because when I was leaving chief counsel, I, I said the only firm that would have hired me was Leonard Layden, small firm, and I was making 40000 as a GS-14. I was saying this because you told me you have to, I have to cut your pay down to 30000 And then I said, well, I'm the only government lawyer that ever took a pay cut <laughs> to leave government. And, and but... But, but the good thing, he said, I'll give you 25% of whatever you bring in. Well, by the second year, I was bringing in 240,000. I was bringing more in commissions at my salary. And he said, oh, you're making too much money. He said, we need to make you a partner. <laughs> Cut your pay. <laughs> but one of the things I learned was in growing my practice, um, there's a lot of people that need representation that, that cannot afford a big law firm because I, I know that at one of the ABA meetings, one, one of our former uh, district court judges asked, uh, as one of the, asked me in the, in the private, how do you compete against this, this uh, very well-known lawyer in your town? I said, oh, that's easy. He only takes cases where he needs, gets a $50,000 retainer. I take cases where I get a $2,500 retainer or 5,000. And there's a whole lot more of those cases than there are 50,000 retainers. And so it's not a matter of make, oh, making the money, but it's a matter of helping people. Mm -hmm. And if you help people in their tax cases, the, the money will fo follow. And, so, and, uh, and, and you, so you get a lot of experience. So, so I, I learned that. And the other thing that I learned is in private practice, your reputation is very important. You, you have to have a reputation for honesty when you're dealing with taxpayers or the other side. Uh, 
lawyers on the other side, treat them, treat them with respect and let you, your award be your bond. Because uh, I know that when I was representing clients at, at our at district council in Houston, at, before they became area council under chief council, I, I had a, one of the, the head of the program says, well, I don't believe your client, but I believe you. And if you believe your client, that's good enough for me. Wow. You know, and so, so the, your, your, your reputation precedes you. So, for, you know, and also be open to helping people, even though um, I, I never, I, I never, I, I never fired a client for not paying me. I stayed with their case all the way up until the end. I, I know sometimes lawyers feel like they need to drop a client because they haven't paid. Uh, a situation is different, but I, I never let a, go, a client know because they couldn't pay me. So I, I represented them all the way until the end. So I think your, your reputation uh, and whatever case you're given, whether it's the, uh, what I, when we call it, when I was in private room, a dog case, if you, even if you get a case that you call a, a dog case, or do the best that you can. Like my grandfather said, the cotton fields, soma la bota. Soma la bota means step on the boot. It really means give it, give it the best and, and, and do the best you can in that case. And when you do the best that you can in that case, people will notice that you've done the best and, and people will want to give you more. So if you if you can do that with a dog case, let me give you a real case. <laughs> so, so anyway, well, that's really admirable. Um, tell us now about how you became interested in pursuing a position on the tax board. Well, at the end of my thirteen our thirteen years in private practice in San Antonio, uh, you know, being a solo for two years is really is really tough because when you work solo, you don't have anybody to bounce the ball with. You want somebody that you can bounce the ball with, talk to them about the case. If you're in left field, literally, you know, left field, figure of speech, like you're in the wrong field, okay? Uh, you need to know that and you need to pass it, have somebody to talk to. Well, by that time, it was difficult and I was trying to figure, Terry and I were actually at the USC Tax Institute in, in, in January of 1994, the, 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 the day before the Martin Luther King weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and we were discussing what we, what we, Terry wanted to know, if, what else could I accomplish? We had accomplished so much in our private practice, 13 years. And she felt that we should be able to do more for our, our country for, for our, our culture and our community. Sure. Yeah. So, and at that, that same time, uh, Willie Hubbard, our, our, our area council, our chief, our district council, that's the way, that's the way it was described in a chief, office of chief council in Houston. Houston, San Antonio, and Dallas, and San Antonio was represented by Austin. And he, after litigating cases against him, he said, one, there's a vacancy in the court. You should consider applying for it. And I, I, I didn't know, I, I was really uh, honored by him saying that with quite an accomplishment. And, and so I, I told Terry when we were discussing this on the beach in Malibu, the, the day before it's Mother- a good place to have a conversation. <laughs> right. And, 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 and that night or that morning, the, the, the Martin Luther King earthquake of the Northridge hit and it was a very devastating hurt. Mm. So I remember that. But we said right before we, that, that evening, we said, well, let's, let's go ahead and seek a position in the tax court. But we didn't know how to, how to accomplish that. I, and I, the ABA tax section, I, I usually, every year from 1982-95, I always went to the ABA meeting in, in, in May of Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, the ABA is meeting in Houston and I want to, well, maybe we can go there and find out how to apply for a position on the tax board. I actually thought it was an application process. You actually got a form, you know, an application a form to apply for the, your position on the tax court. So we went there. Uh, a week later, there were meeting, And I, I looked at the ABA tax brochure uh, for that meeting. And it said, 
the executive committee on the tax court appointments was meeting next morning, at, I think at nine o'clock. I was the first one there. Uh, I got there and I went into the room looking for an application. There were no applications in any of the tables. And then all these senior looking attorneys started coming in and the very distinguished lawyers that I knew who they were, they didn't know me. And I, it, it didn't feel right. So I, I tiptoed out and I went upstairs and I ran into my professor and mentor, Professor Ira yeah. Shepard. I, I wanted to talk to him. I wanted to bounce up the idea of me, of what he thought about me seeking a position with the United States Tax Board. And he was ecstatic. That's great. He was ecstatic and he started announcing it to lawyers around me <laughs> that I was looking for a position on the tax board. And I, I couldn't stop him because he was announcing it. And, and I said, I, I want to discuss it with you about the pay cut, <laughs> you know, and, and whether I have any chance. It's a long shot of me getting a position on the tax board. And then he introduced me to two lawyers, well-known lawyers, one, one from uh, the West Coast and one from Houston. And they said, oh, yeah, we, we tried it. I, I wanna, one of them had tried for eight years and hadn't gotten a position on the tax board. The other one had only tried for four or five years. And I said, well, if these two fine lawyers cannot get one, what are the chances of me as a solo and, and, you know, and, you know, and getting a position on the tax board? But that's, that's how it started. But in January of 94, I went to the ABA in, in, in like I said, in Houston. And in, in March, when we were going to go skiing, Terry and I and our two sons, Juan and Jaime, we go skiing every year to either Brackenridge, Colorado, or Rio Dosa, New Mexico. And I get a call in the middle of the night, at, at, I think at, at about 10 o'clock my time, which is 11 o'clock in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. time. And one of the, there was a, President Clinton had a committee of five headed by the Secretary of the Treasury, Lloyd Benson. That was his committee to determine who to, who to select. Okay. One of the committee members, I, I didn't know he was a committee member, uh, but he called on the phone and he called the house first uh, to, and he talked to Jaime. Jaime alerted he was gonna call back in about an hour. And he wanted uh, Terry's home. Well, when he calls back, tell him to call me on call your dad on the cell phone. <clears throat> and he said, well, we like to, it was uh, Secretary of the Treasury uh, Tax Policy, Leslie Samuels. He says, uh, we'd like to interview you next, you this week, this coming week on Wednesday. And this was on a Friday before. And the, right. I said, and, and uh, this time Terry goes racing back into the, to, to, there's a, a brochure that she prepared to, to give to everybody. And she looked at it and he was named was there. It was one of the committee of five mm -hmm. that was on that committee, including the commissioner of the Internal Revenue, the uh, head of the uh, Department of Justice Tax Division, Loretta Algred, uh, uh, chief counsel head, um, and Gene Hanson, general counsel of the treasury. And she found his name there. And he just, he, he, she wrote me, say, say yes. <laughs> By that time I had said, well, I'm so glad you called. We're going skiing tomorrow. Can we what? do it the following week? I'll, I'll be available. And, and, and you could hear him clear in his throat. <laughs> like, I'm talking to a country boy here. <laughs> and he says, you know, you don't, you don't know how difficult it is to get the commissioner of the internal venue and the chief counsel here. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to get our committee members. And by the time they tell you, so says, say yes, Said, oh, oh, and by that time he had said, bring your sons to Washington to see them. They'll have a great time for, for spring break. He said, oh, we'd love to bring our sons to, to Washington, D.C. Uh, anyway, so. It was a quick change of plans. It was a quick change of plans. It worked okay. out. And then, so I met with three of the people on the committee, including the chief of chief counsel, um, David Jordan, and the right now, great head of the Department of Justice mm -hmm. Tax Division. And then a month later, I get another call, but this time it was, they said it's the secretary's on the phone. And I said, secretary, this is somebody important. And, but we had two secretaries. We had Secretary Henderson Janetta, right. Secretary of the Treasury of HUD, right. and we had Senator Lloyd Benson, Secretary of the Treasury. But I knew it, was, it, was, it had to be Lloyd Benson. 
So, and, I, and he said, we want you to come up th this week to, to, be, to be interviewed by the secretary and, and, and the commissioner of the internal review and, and uh, Peggy Richardson mm -hmm. and, and Gene Hansen, general counsel of the treasury. So we, I got interviewed by all of them and then went back to Texas and I was in, during Fiesta, uh, we, we have a 10 day celebration uh, it was in April of '94, okay. and then in July I got a call from. It was kind of quiet. I got a call from Se Secretary of the Treasury, uh, General Counsel of the Treasury, Jean Hansen, and she said, "Keep it quiet. We're going to submit your name for the president. Don't tell anybody." Well, can I tell my wife? <laughs> so, oh, you can tell your wife, <laughs> but tell her not to, to spread it out because. You know, wow. we want to keep it secret. Anyway, that's the way. It, that's fantastic. That would be, had to be hard to sit on that. That was hard to sit on. And then it, it was in September during, uh, Terry said, if I, she thought I would get nominated. It would be during Hispanic month because I would be the first Hispanic right. appointed to the court. And uh, we were eating at our favorite Mexican restaurant, La, La, Taco, Taco Cabana. Anybody know Taco Cabana from Texas? I oh, do. thank you. <laughs> Tanya, thank you. Brent, thank you. Th thank you. Anyway, we're it's open 24 hours. <laughs> it's, it's a drive through restaurant or you can go inside. And I, I get a call from the Washington Post asking me the, what was my, my impression of being the first Hispanic appointed to the tax oh. court. And we knew nothing about it. Okay. And so it was a total so shock. That's how you found out. Because Henry B. Gonzalez, our congressman from San Antonio, had, had called me twice to, to uh, give me the good news, we presume. And I called him back and he was busy. Oh, wow, okay. And so we missed each other, but it was uh, the, the Washington Post. And, and Terry told him, told the person, told my secretary, to, to the hole, hole, have him hold on the line. So we rushed back to my office. There's only one exit over, one exit on the freeway. And Terry decided, she would call the press secretary of the White House. She just called the operator. And she, she asked, we had the Washington Post online and she wanted, wanted, wanted them to confirm it that I had been nominated to, to the court. Uh, and sure, sure enough, they sent her a fax from the White House okay. press, the press office of the White House. And President Clinton nominated the first African-American, Maurice Foley. And, and the first case back myself. And so you and Judge Foley had your confirmation hearing together, is that right? Our, our first confirmation hearing before the Senate Finance Committee, President Clinton nominated us, we were together. And then we were both nominated by President Obama in 2000 and we had our hearing together again. So uh, Judge Foley said we're tied in the hip. I can see why. Um, so Judge, tell us about your, some of your experiences as a judge on the tax court. And maybe given that you've, um, you know, served almost now two full terms. Like, what have you seen? Uh, what changes have you seen in litigation before the tax court? Well, uh, maybe what tips do you have for our students and, and graduates who who are engaged in a tax controversy practice and have a lot of their cases before the tax court? Professor Helbig, that's a compound question. Exactly, that's right. Oh, good. Take any one of those <laughs> that, you, that you okay prefer. But at this time, what I would like to say, one of the one of the wonderful things about being on the tax court, I, I've had wonderful clerks like yourself that they, they look good and I appreciate that. But some of my clerks are here, Mark, Mark Perla, uh, he was my number one NYU clerk and he did a fine job. But after that, I continued to hire NYU clerks. Jeremy Abrams is right next to him. He's, Jeremy, if you look, raise your hand. He's, he's number 13. And, and Brent Helmick, uh, Professor Brent Helmick, you're my number five NYU clerk. And I think, oh, Ben Friedman, number 17. And so um, I've had 22 NYU clerks. And I should mention, there's a number of your former clerks that are watching on the Zoom webinar as well. Oh, hi, everyone. And I've had 16. <laughs> and so I've, I've enjoyed working with them. Oh, Tanya, she's a Georgetown graduate. My law clerk, she's here, Tanya. And thank you for, thank you for being here, Tanya. Anybody, on the, any of uh, my former... My former law clerks are here, but 
anyway, I, I always like to say my law clerk, uh, actually, what I've noticed about hiring law clerks, they all seem to be so smart. And I told one judge, you know, these clerks are all smarter than I am. He says, and they said, he said, well, what's, that was Judge Foley, he says, what's wrong with hiring clerks that are smarter than you? And he says, in fact, I, I only hire clerks that are smarter than me. <laughs> so they make you it's look good practice, good. right? Thank you. Anyway, uh, what's part of your compound question? Just well, I'll tell you what. One thing, just when, since you're talking about your clerks, and I did have the, uh, the, the true privilege and benefit to clerk in Judge Vasquez's chambers. This was from, what was this, 2000 to 2001? Um, yeah, for that year, and Judge Vasquez was talking about the benefit um, when he's in private practice of having somebody to bounce ideas off of to talk about cases. Kind of my favorite memory of clerking for you was, uh, you know, the judges' chambers and the clerks have these that nice offices onto the side, but the judges' chambers are huge. Um, and Judge Vasquez had this great basketball goal <laughs> yes. in the back corner. Um, the office is large. He's got, he had a, a couch like towards the, the front part. Yes, thank and you. And so I would come in to chat about the cases. But then while we were doing that, I could constantly, I always wanted to shoot from behind the couch. Right. Right. But, it was about from like from me now to maybe where the camera is in the back of the room. Right. Um, but, and Judge Vasquez would rebound with, with a, for me. And, uh, and we'd be talking about the cases, talking about the case that I was working on, and that was our way of, of chatting about the uh, yeah, the, the opinions that were in the draft process. Brandon would would th would make the basket from right from the fireplace here all the way to the camera, and I would say, okay, if if you make it, petitioner wins, <laughs> and if you don't make it, respondent wins. <laughs> That's how we decided our case. But. Uh, uh, anyway, but then you, you used to play a lot of basketball also with your co clerk oh, number right. four, Ivan Morales. Right. Uh, that was from NYU. Clerk basketball team that we played in the Fairfax League, and actually one of my classmates from NYU, um, the program who was clerking with us, Andy Roberson, was a phenomenal uh, basketball player. This is a little bit off topic, but um, <laughs> but anyway, that was the, the but it does go to show that I mean, one thing that's really nice about the tax court, you've got 19 judges that all have their chambers in one location. Those judges typically have two law clerks each. Senior judges are there as well and have an additional clerk. Right. Um, Senior judges only have one clerk. That's right. And then you've got the special trial judges who are just down the um, up the street a little bit. Uh, right. There, there are, we have six, five, we have six special trial judges and they're all in our building now. Okay. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. And so you've got a, just this pool of law clerks that are there. A lot of them are either right out of um, law school or out of the LLM program. I mean, some are career clerks, but it's a, it's this great, there's a great social aspect to it as well when you're clerking at the tax court. Lots right. of fun softball games um, on the mall. Baseball. Right, that's right. And, uh, and we had our own basketball league, our team. That was, so that's, that was a, a, a really enjoyable aspect of the job as well. Yeah, I've had, I've had a number of clerks tell me their best job they ever had in tax was being a law clerk at the tax court. I've had several clerks tell me that. So uh, maybe tell us about some of the, the changes that you've seen in the operations um, before the tax court during your tenure on the court. And then just looking at the time, then maybe we'll um, open okay. up the floor for questions from the, well, the, our participants. The biggest change we've seen is obviously in response to the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19. In March of 2020, when the pandemic was declared by the president, um, and that year, the court canceled about six or seven sessions, including my session in Dallas, uh, Iowa. Des Moines, Iowa was supposed to be in June. In May, I was supposed to be in Jacksonville, Mississippi, and uh, Memphis, Tennessee. All those sessions got canceled. And, and then once the court figured out how to get a handle on it, they did a very effective job, a, a wonderful job, actually of going to remote proceedings. Mm -hmm. And I, I conducted 11 trial sessions. First one was Winston-Salem, North Carolina, okay. in remote. And, and so we were, I had been there and picked up the Bell case, BLK, but we, we interpreted conservation easements for the first uh, okay. code, code section 170H. But anyway, so we, we had several sessions and uh, the court really did a wonderful job of, of doing remote trials. And 
like I said, I handled 10 sessions remotely. I had one special trial in Spokane, Washington that lasted a week. And we handled that remotely. Uh, but uh, I could determine credibility based on, I, I was concerned whether you, you, you could determine the credibility of a taxpayer mm -hmm. uh, over the, on the zoom.gov. And you, and I, I believe you can, and I, 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 I felt comfortable doing it. Okay. But now we're going back to in-person sessions. Although the court has three sessions, usually the, the fall session from January, from se September through December, the winter session from January to March, the uh, fall, the spring session from April to June, and but in every session now, you know they're all in person. There's uh, has one or two in in person se uh, no remote sessions, okay. and and also uh, either side petitioners or respondent can file a motion to have the case conducted remotely. Oh wow, okay, so it's going to be an ongoing feature then. Uh, right, so uh, right practice before the court. So I, I think it will be because we find there's benefits to it. Um, there are certain cities, uh, you know, we, in about 34 of our cities, we have our own courtroom and about uh, out of the 74 and about, about half of them, we have our own courtroom like in San Antonio, Houston or, or, or Dallas, but in Lubbock and in El Paso, we borrow space from the federal, local federal courts. And I know that in some states, I know, it's difficult to get borrow space, especially after pen, the pandemic. Not sure. But the other thing that I've seen quite a bit, and I'm kind of proud of the fact that Congress has so much uh, respect for the court, is that how much our jurisdiction has increased. And since when I got on the court in 1995, most of our jurisdiction was over deficiency cases. The majority of our cases were deficiency cases. But in 1996, after I was there, Congress increased our jurisdiction to interest abatement cases under section 6404. A year later, 1997, Congress gave us jurisdiction over worker classifications under code section 7436. 1998, Congress expanded and gave us a new jurisdiction over, for the first time over collection cases, mm -hmm. lien and levy case under section, code section 6320, section 6330. All these code sections I learned what, to write them up from NYU, you learned that you know, and, 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 and then also expanded court innocent spouse relief under code section 6015. And then Congress also gave us whistleblower jurisdiction in 2006. And then finally Congress has got us in the passport business. All right, that's reviewing the most recent one. Whether a taxpayer has a seriously delinquent penal, I mean, uh, liability, uh, because if they do, the Secretary of the Treasury is required to inform the Secretary of State that the taxpayer has a seriously delinquent penalty, okay. uh, no li tax liability, which may uh, re cause the revocation of the passport or make a renewal difficult. So uh, I'm glad that Congress has that much, uh, you know, trust in the court that it keeps increasing our jurisdiction. So that's been some of the changes. Okay. Wonderful. Um, at this point, I thought we're just a little bit past an hour, but we we have the room for the rest of the night. So I figured if they're going to kick us out, but I thought we would open up the floor for questions from um, members that are, of our audience. And I'm not sure if there's a way for people on the Zoom webinar to pose questions, but and we, if you're if you have one, we've got a, a microphone here so that our remote attendees could all get hear it, hear the get the benefit of your question. And, and there's so many of you all here. We we thank you, thank you for being here. We we appreciate it. But I'll be glad to answer any questions. Uh, but don't be shy. My granddaughter, that's my granddaughter right there, Claire Melia Vasquez. <laughs> she didn't have a question, but she's way, I'm glad that she's here. Like I said, we're proud of the fact that 45 years later from when I graduated here in uh, 19, May of 1995, or June 1st, 1978, 45 years, she just started here at age 18 and at age 19, she just turned 19 and her birthday in March, uh, March 15th. She's, um, in, she's freshman year at the Stern Business right. School. So, oh, go ahead, granddaughter. Sure. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Claire Vasquez. I am a freshman at NYU Stern School of Business, studying finance. Um, and my question is, what personal character related strengths do you draw on to be a successful federal judge? Thank you for the question. A difficult question, but you know, to be a federal judge, I, I really believe you, you have to have the ability to listen to, to both sides. You, you have to understand that people are nervous when they come to federal court whether you're in, the, you're, you're in the U.S. District Court or the U.S. Tax Court or whatever court you're in, most people have the only court they've ever been to is maybe traffic court. And the, the people don't like to go to traffic court either. So they get nervous walking into our federal building. Nah, I think what you need to be an effective federal judge or a judge for any court is the ability to, to listen to the people before you. I like to start with the premise that anybody that testifies before me is coming in to testify truthfully. And, uh, and I, it, it's up to, it, they, their credibility may change depending on what, what, how the witness testifies or, or on cross-examination. So I think the ability to be able to listen. I, I, and the other thing, Carmelia, really, I think, the other thing is you have to be willing to work hard and do the best that you can on every case. And like I said, one ability is to hire great clerks like the clerks that are here, and you know, that are willing to work hard. And, and as I've always told you, give it all you got. You step on the boot, like uh, the, my, my, the Terry's book. Uh, Terry wrote my biography with uh, uh, Anthony Hader, co-writer. So anyway, thank you for the question. <laughs> yes, okay, you bet, Just to repeat Kate's question really quick, it's a great one. Um, the question being, when Judge Vasquez, when you're drafting an opinion, who do you have as the prime audience of that opinion? Is that the tax bar? Uh, so in, in, if that's the case, you might write in a more technical manner. Is it the parties themselves? Do you try to have your opinions be understandable by lay people? Um, or even the prospect of drafting your opinions to get the attention of Congress, uh, where there might be a need for legislative um, change? Okay. Who do you have in mind when you're drafting your opinion? Thank you for the question, Mr. Porter. What's your first name? Hey, thank you. I just met you. Thank you. That's a good question. Sometimes you're writing for all three, but what I usually like to write for, I personally like to write for, is for the people, the parties th that are before you. Because if you're holding against the taxpayer or you're holding, because you, you know, it's either the, the petitioner, the taxpayer, or the respondent, the respondent is always the commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS. I really believe that you, you need to explain to the petitioner, if you're writing the opinion for the petitioner, in the sense you're writing to the respondent, why the taxpayer has prevailed. And if you're holding against the taxpayer, you need to explain to the taxpayer, petitioner, why are you holding against him, him or her? And, but obviously you're running for the tax bar. Um, you want, you want to, you want to write for the tax bar so they can know how you, you arrived at your opinion and explain it. And it's based on your research. Because what you're doing is you're applying the law or the facts of the case, but sometimes you're writing to Congress. And uh, you, I, I like to say, sometimes taxpayers, when, when they're like, a, there were some cases where I've had taxpayers in dependency cases, 
or they want to claim a dependency exemption uh, when for their nieces or their uh, somebody that they're helping support, and there's no way that you can hold for them under the code section, the 152, 153, and so sometimes you say you're 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 sympathetic to their position, but it's Congress has written the law this way, and so if if you, if you want to look at any of my opinions where I've said, you know, that you have a sympathetic case, um, the court is not unsympathetic to your situation, but Congress writes the law. At that time, I'm writing for Congress, but I'm writing for the taxpayer to explain why we can't hold for them. But so there's a number of cases like that. And judge, I'm not sure if this is still the procedure, but when I was there, um, the judges will submit their draft opinions to the chief judge of the court yes. first. The chief judge has a council, um, and you kind of send your opinion to the council first, and they they review it and mark it up and have suggestions. As uh, part of this, is to help produce kind of a uniform body of, of tax court precedent yes. and um, have a check on the the legal determinations that are being made um, in the opinion. But I remember doing this, and and I don't know if our uh, other co clerks here remember. Our goal was to see like how little um, revisions could we get from coming back from counsel's office, right? You know, like you'd, you'd hope there was not a wash in red, uh, you know, marks on that. So that was kind of the fun aspect of how clean can that opinion come back from counsel's office? And my clerk said here, Tanya, Mark, Jeremy, and you all remember those red markings, right? those <laughs> marks made from the reviewers. That when you were there with Bob Pomeranz had right. that position and uh, we, we we still have the review process. Okay. And they still, I know when um, one, one judge, Judge Cohen, when she was the chief judge, she made no change. It was, was rare. She she would get put, put a star. She liked oh, wow. she, she, that. That's uh, impressive. Like a, right. Or uh, anyway, so it was interesting. But each judge is different, you know, the, how they do it. But they, they review on their on. They still do the review process. Okay. The review process is very important, but it, it, it does give uniformity to the interpretation of the, te the, the tax laws, the, our country's tax laws. So the, the review process is still there and it's, it's an ongoing part, but, but they have more reviewers now. I think when okay. you were there, well, there was only two reviewers. There's Bob Pomerantz and his assistant, who I'm blanking on her name right now, but she's right. qualified as well. Right, um, there was only two, yeah. And so it's, it's still a very important process to view, but it's very interesting that as a, as a, and again, when I, when I explain this to US district court judges around the country, um, you mean when I send my opinion to the chief judge, I, I have to send my opinion to the chief judge and they have to review it with their gut reviewers and if, if you don't make the corrections, uh, it, it, may, it may force the chief judge to send the case to court conference right. under code section 7460. I want you all to remember that code section 7460. <laughs> so anyway, that's the court review process. But it, it, it still exists, very vibrant. And uh, you may end up in court conference. Sure. And again, you, you put a lot, you put, each judge puts a lot of work in, into their cases. And so- uh, But yeah, get, the tax court, there are a number of checks along the way um, as an institution to, from the tax court's perspective to get the correct legal interpretation of the law. Um, and particularly because it's gonna be binding on all 19 tax court judges once that division opinion is issued. Right, uh, out of my 703 opinions, I know that I've issued 48 division opinions where we've interpreted the statute for the first time. Majority of opinions, like 650 or tax court memorandum opinions, where the law is settled and you're just applying uh, the settled law to the facts of that case before you. Correct. That's the theory, at least, right? Um, right. <laughs> sometimes these memo opinions, in my mind, are. You have not, a question back. I'm sorry. Okay. And I think we have a question over here, too. Yes, Milad. Can, do we, can we get the, let's get the microphone. Hello, Your Honor. Um, Hello. 
Uh, my name is Milad Sefetpour. Uh, are, are you a litigator? Pardon? Uh, he's a student. <laughs> you're a student. Very I'm good. Student. Usually when I say you're on or is you're <laughs> litigators. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in another life. But um, I noticed that you have a long and very um, solid foundation of uh, clerks who all are very happy to see you. And I wanted to ask what makes a good clerk in your eyes? And do you have any advice for anyone who's interested in clerking? You know, when I, when I got on the court, I, I went and talked to several of our seniors, several of our judges that had been there. And I asked them the same question is, just, what advice can you give me about how to be a successful tax court judge? And Judge Art Nims, with our former chief judge, he's since passed away. Uh, he said, Juan, what I can tell you is this. Um, Hire the best clerk you can. The other advice I would give you is don't hire any bad clerks. <laughs> and I said, Judge, how, how can you tell the difference when you're interviewing them? And he says, that's the problem, Juan. You can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> OK. But anyway, the way I do it, uh, you have several resumes and applicants. You live when there is a position. I know that most of my NYU clerks, I've all hired them through the NYU program when, or, or you know, when NYU would come in and visit uh, with, with a bunch of uh, potential clerks. Like you they come down with about 20 or 30 students. So, uh, Brent, when you were here, I think you came by bus. We came by bus because the train tracks were washed out from a, actually a hurricane that came up the East Coast. And then our bus broke down on the New Jersey Turnpike all the way down. So it's amazing that it all worked out. We got there like it. And and when lunchtime. and when Brent came, uh, he was my first clerk. I was going to interview out of eight potential clerks, and I only had five minutes to interview him. <laughs> it was like thirty speed days. And, and what I noticed about his resume, I mean, we, we, I think we went to law school at Wake Forest. That's right. And 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 then uh, he. Had, Excellent credentials, like just like the other eight, other seven applicants. And what I noticed in his uh, area of interest, he had Texas Texas barbecue. And I said, "Well, what what's Texas barbecue about?" And so I asked him, and he, he I found out that he lived he lived for a couple of years in New Braunfels, Texas, which is about thirty miles from San Antonio. And when, when we were visiting with him, we talked about different things. And then five minutes, I found out. Uh, I couldn't tell if he had any connections to Texas other than Texas barbecue. And I asked him that he worked at a, a an entertainment area uh, like Disneyland. It was a, a water park. A water park yeah. called Slitterbomb. And our sons, Juan and Jaime, had visited that water park. And I said to myself, anybody who, who works at Slitterbomb is good enough, to, can work there during the summer, <laughs> That's a it, is good enough to work for me. And, and so it's my high school job that got me to clerkship. Not <laughs> that. But, but you know, the other thing I try to connect with is when I look at a, a clerk, that I, I want to see an interest in tax, a passion for tax. Because I, I've told people that interest might be considered tax as a profession. To be in tax, you have to have a passion for it. You have to love it. You, you, you mustn't just like it. Liking it is not enough. Carmela, you, you, you have to have the passion. You will. <laughs> okay. Your dad likes it, your tío likes it, and your, your abuelito likes it. We all love it. Okay. So, you, you know, you, you, you have to have the passion for it. And the other thing I look for, how many tax courses they've taken while they're in their JD program, uh, their LLM. Well, the LLM, there's going to be all tax. But what other positions did they hold in tax? Did they join the tax society? Did they volunteer for VITA, their tax returns, either in college or in law school? So I have to see that passion. And that's what I like. And, and the other thing, they have to express an interest in loving to, how to be good writers, good researchers. But it's, it's, but it's just like Judge Ardames told me, when, when you interview students, you don't know they're going to be a great law clerk or just a so-so clerk. But, but uh, all my 28 clerks that I've had, law clerks, I've had 28 law clerks, uh, they, they've all been great. 
I've, I've had like 48 uh, interns and externs, uh, a few from NYU, a lot of them from U of H and um, Georgetown. And out of 75 or 76 law clerks, interns and, and clerks, 43% of them have been women. 48% uh, have been women and men of color. So I like diversity, but I also like uh, geographic diversity. I like people that from come from California or New York, um, Florida or the Midwest, Iowa, you know, Michigan. You just, uh, you know, don't ge ge geographic diversity. Thank you. Yes. Hey, Mark. My, my so, number one, why you law clerk? You did a thank you for doing a great job, Mark. <laughs> thank you. So, Judge Vasquez, I apologize, but my question is for Brian. So, okay. <laughs> okay. I, I, other than the resume submitted to Judge Vasquez, did any other resume say Texas barbecue? No, that was, that was you know, I, I don't know if people still do this. We were counseled at the time. You should list some of your personal interests at the bottom of it. It did. I, I didn't change that because I didn't know if I that did was targeted. In, uh, in a fantastic <laughs> um, Texas barbecue place in New Braunfels, a Waterloo based smoked meat company. Everybody called it Janie's. Um, and I always worked at places where I loved to eat so I could like you know, uh, uh, get free food. That was a big part of it. No, that was right. that was not just for Judge Vasquez. That was universal. Well, so while we're discussing food, now I'll ask Judge Vasquez. So is the traditional clerk birthday party slash holiday party still Uncle Julio's for fajitas? It still is. Yeah. All right. <laughs> In Washington, D.C., it was whenever a clerk left or it was a birthday, we would take him to Uncle Julio's. Oh, uh, restaurant, that second restaurant in Arlington, yeah. Virginia. Yes. Jeremy, my, hey, my number 13 thing for you. Thank you. I was the only so so clerk. Uh, <laughs> I, <ever heard. laughs> um, I have a comment and a question. Quick comment. You, you talked about when you were seeking the, the judgeship and you and Terry talked about wanting to serve your country more. Uh, I think a lot of people don't realize it can also be a dangerous job and, uh, you know, especially in a politicized environment. So uh, uh, just something, uh, thank you for your service and, and serving in that role. But uh, my question is something I was going to ask you anyway. What is it like being a senior status judge now and what differences are there in your day to day job versus when you're in um, regular status? You know, you, you still have a, you still have the same position. You still uh, the, the one thing I don't like about it, I, I would I prefer, I would have, I prefer to have two clerks rather than one, that, that's a big difference. But, and I'm, I'm still very involved. I'm going on trial sessions. I'm handling as many trial sessions as, as the regular court ju the judges that are in, in, in their regular service. When, we, when the judges talk about the regular service during the 15 years term, you know, where they serve their first 15 years, under the code, and if, when any, any of y'all here at anyway, when y'all are bored at night and you need you you actually have some free time, if you have any free time, I know you don't. Look up at under code section 7441 or 7443. And the, those code sections 7441 through 447 is all about how, how much judges make on the tax court and how many clerks we're allowed to have, how, how we travel. And so it, it's really interesting. Um, but so it, 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 it's there. But you know, Jeremy, it's an interesting question. Uh, and Terry can know this. Uh, one of the, I never realized, I know that in two, after 9-11 after or right before 9-11, I went to one of the Western states and we had, we had a, Taxpayer that was constitu constitutionally challenged, meaning uh, they're a, a protester. Uh, the IRS is no longer allowed to use the word protester. Uh, they can they're constantly challenged, and they were writing me very le letters that were kind of threatening. And so we we, we sent it to our chief counsel's office, our chief judge's office, for somebody to look at them, and they they said. This they sent it on to the U.S. Marshals for a review, and they said they looked him up, and turned out he had just been released from prison for 
federal firearm uh, violation. Mm -hmm. And so the, the marshals said to me, and this is in 2001, you, when you go to this city where you're going in the Western state, check in under an assumed name and be, be ready to use, we recommend you use a bulletproof vest and we're gonna assign two marshals to you to stay in your hotel. Wow. And when you come out of the hotel and you get into our black suburban, don't linger, go straight right in because you be, may be under somebody's scope. And I said to myself, and Terry was with me, and I told her to stay in the hotel room. And being my, Terry's a nurse, and she said, if everything happens to you, I'm going to be with her with you. And it, it was the first time I thought, I thought to myself, wow, I'm a tax lawyer. What am I doing? <laughs> We're not, you know, I'm not a, another type of federal judge, you know. Anyway, so it was interesting. But, and so that just, a side comment, Jeremy, but I thought, I thought, I thought that's where you were hitting, but I don't think, it's, but it's, it's, it's an honor and a privilege to serve our country as a, a tax court judge on the United States tax court. I'm, I'm really honored and privileged, and I thank President Clinton and then President Obama for the, the opportunity to be nominated and, and for making history on the tax court. And I, and I, I thank NYU for, for, for preparing me for what, you know, give me the education they gave me. And I, I, I want to thank Professor Jer Manning for putting out a good student uh, like myself and all the other professors did a great job teaching here at, at the NYU program. Well, with that, um, please join me in giving a round of applause to Judge Vasquez. Wonderful to have you back here. Thank you.